first to our plenary sessions, it's our very great pleasure to listen to Mar Bawai Soro, who's going to speak about Mary in the Catholic Assyrian dialogue. Mar Bawai is a bishop of the Church of the East. He is in charge, I believe, of the Western Diocese in the U.S. here. He is the ecumenical officer representing his church on behalf of the patriarch. I think he studied for a time here at the Catholic University, and he studied also for a time in Rome. The Church of the East is the church which, in my youth, we used to call Nestorian. But this is, for a number of reasons, very inappropriate. First of all, the Church of the East has never held the heresy attributed to Nestorius of saying that Christ is two persons inside one body, a kind of pantomime horse. That was never the belief of the Church of the East. Indeed, Nestorius himself did not hold the Nestorian heresy. <laughs> but, more to the point, while the Church of the East holds Nestorius in honor, he has never occupied a dominant position in its tradition. Much more, the Church of the East honors the memory of that great theologian, Theodore of Mopsuestia, the interpreter, one of the greatest uh, patristic scriptural authors who died in full communion with the worldwide church, but who was condemned by the Byzantine church some centuries after his death. The Church of the East numbers among its writers St. Isaac of Nineveh, Isaac the Syrian, who is deeply loved equally in the Greek and the Slav traditions. The Church of the East was once very wide-ranging. Its missions extended across Turkestan into China. It has suffered greatly from persecution in recent centuries, not least in this present century. It's not very easy for us to have personal contact with members of this ancient tradition. Thus, it is a privilege to listen to our speaker today. I believe the Church of the East has never officially accepted the Council of Ephesus, but that does not mean that it does not hold the Holy Virgin in honor. And it is exactly about this that we look forward now to hearing from Mar Bawai. Thank you, Your Grace, for this introduction. I could not have better spoken about uh, issues concerning uh, Nestorius and Nestorianism better than, yet, than what you have uh, and how you have said it. Uh, it's a privilege, indeed, for me to stand before you and speak about a very beloved and dear topic to all of us. I am thankful to uh, Jack Fiegel for his organization and invitation and also particularly thankful to uh, Father Taft for arranging for this invitation. 
I look forward for the continuation of our dialogue, as rightfully pointed out by His Grace, that the Church of the East has been a church removed from dialogue with the apostolic churches. Only in recent times we have come closer, thanks to the openness, spirit of charity, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, is to be praised for any positive future result that could be uh, taken from this process. Let me start my paper. The condemnation of Nestorius and his teachings at the Council of Ephesus declared a fissure in the lives of our churches for centuries. Today, this seemingly insurmountable theological rupture has even has been overcome by the common Christological declaration of November 1994. No longer will the cries of Theotokos be used as a source of division, and now the appellation Christotokos can finally have its proper dignity. This centuries-long antagonism between the Greco-Roman Church and the Church of the East grew out of a dispute which arose over the proper employment of Marian terminology, namely Theotokos and Christotokos, in describing the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it was an ecclesial political dispute between the seas of Alexandria and Constantinople that eventually manifested itself in the theological contention and personality clash between Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius of Constantinople at the Council of Ephesus. This dispute ignited one of the most disruptive and destructive controversies in Christendom, which spread throughout the entire church in the Persian Empire. This horrible history indicates the importance of our subject matter and the need to treat differing views with charity and the need to seek understanding of the divergent formulation used by different peoples in different cultures and places. As we seek to address the place in Mary in the Catholic Assyrian dialogue, this ancient dispute is but one facet of the rich Christian apostolic tradition that both churches represent. Realizing the paucity of Western literature and the Mariological dev devotions, spirituality and liturgical life of the Church of the East, I shall endeavor to present a brief overview of this tradition, realizing the limits of this talk. The accentuation will be placed upon the distinct traditions of the Church of the East while also dealing with specific points of convergence and divergence with Roman Catholic Mariology. Who is Mary for the Church of the East? The Church of the East holds with profound affinity the understanding and veneration of the Blessed Mother. According to her unique role in the history of our salvation, Mary is honored in relationship to God and to us. She is the handmaid of the Father, the Mother of the Son, and the Temple of the Holy Spirit. Also, according to the Gospel of John, Mary and the beloved disciple are brought together at the foot of the cross where Jesus defines their new relationship as mother and son. The Church of the East venerates Mary because she is seen to be forming with John the first Christian family, each seeing Christ in the other, thus having a profound relationship to the rest of us, the Church. The implication of such veneration of Mary within the limits of orthodoxy is that no matter how or when she is venerated through her devotion, feasts, and memorials, the Virgin Mother is never to be elevated above her son or even equated with him. The Church of the East 
in and through her liturgical celebrations, proclaims God's providence as made known in the gospel so that the person and works of Jesus Christ are made prominent and glorified. This emphasis is given to preserve and make clear a distinction between Mary as mediator between God and men in prayer for help and comfort, which is encouraged among the faithful, and the uniqueness of Christ's role in mediating our redemption. Again, regarding the spirit of devotion to the Virgin, there is little difference except perhaps an emphasis in the honor generally bestowed upon her in either the East or the West. In fact, the tradition of venerating Mary finds its origin in the Christian East. Although the West has throughout many centuries of reflection developed its own particular theological thinking about the mother of our Lord. Let me uh, break uh, from the paper. When I, terminology of East and West, in this paper, uh, what is meant by the East is the church outside of the Roman Empire. And what, the, what is meant by the West is the church inside the Roman Empire. It's unlike the uh, usual usage of East and West. West is meant to the Latin church and East is meant uh, uh, to indicate to the Orthodox church. Here the terminology is different. It's uh, church outside and inside the Roman Empire. However, following the Angsum Lex Orandi Lex Credendi, by making use of the Church of the East book of prayer called Chudra, particularly the liturgical anthems of the Feast of Our Lady, we will be able to gain some insights into the ways this tradition honors the Blessed Mother and the practice by which its adherents pray to her. Quoting directly from the liturgy, that is celebrated in the Church of the East for three of Our Lady's feasts, namely in January, May, and in August, we will observe the following. Holy and the found of divine holy things. She is splendid and fair and the ark of spiritual mysteries. She is renowned in virtue and holy exploit, exploits, a treasury of grace, and a storehouse of heavenly riches. Our Lady, Mary, is more exalted and sublime than any name. She alone, among all the daughters of Eve, is the one whom God chose to be a temple for the Holy Spirit and a mother for the Son of the Highest. Yes, indeed, Mary is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the mother of the Son of God. The prayers and hymns of the liturgy also venerate with the highest marks of respect Mary's intimate and active participation in the mystery of incarnation. These festive prayers continue as follows. In her womb, she bore fire. In her body, she carried, she carried the Shekhinah, Shina is the Hebrew concept of divine presence. Within her soul, the spirit brooded, and Mary became, all in all, a heaven. Do not reproach me, O reader, because I have designated Mary a heaven. And as I think, Mary is more, more excellent, sublime, and exalted than heaven. Furthermore, the Church of the East Fathers never were tired of exalting Mary in terms that could not be applied to any other human being. Among their numerous glorious epithets for her, the most significant, as we have seen, is the title Second Heaven. The liturgical hymn terms it this way, From the second heaven, the ever-virgin, Christ shone forth temporarily for our salvation, temporarily for our salvation. This indicates 
that in the eyes of the Church of the East, Mary deserves the honor of being called heaven, since the eternal Lord of all, the only begotten Son of God, whose eternal dwelling place is in heaven, did in the fullness of time, at the time of incarnation, descend to the world and make the womb of the Virgin his dwelling place, truly a second heaven. Mary is therefore named heaven because of God's unique relationship with her, whose womb became sanctuary of his son. For the Assyrian church, the mysteries of Mary's virginal conception of Jesus and her perpetual virginity are taken in their literal sense, both theologically and pastorally, in order to avoid a mere symbolic approach to describing God's intervention in human history. The Church affirms that, as guided by the Holy Spirit, the Catholic and Apostolic Church has, since its early formation, properly understood Mary's role in God's providence and did so in such a way that conclusions about her virginity were read out of scriptures and interpreted in accord with the living tradition. So, in the Catholic Assyrian dialogue, both of these teachings have been considered as points of convergence rather than divergence. Since both traditions utilize biblical text and receive the common tradition of the early church upon which they base their acceptance. This acceptance is without any hesitation, for they have been affirmed and are manifested in liturgical texts and in the writings of private theologians as well. New Testament texts like Matthew 1, 16 to 25 and Luke 1, 26 to 38 also clearly show that Mary's perpetual virginity was due to the total dedication of her life to the will of the Father and the mission of her Son. In this fashion, Mary becomes, for the Church of the East, as for all Christians, a figure of great spiritual significance, both as a model Christian believer to the secular world and as an example of holiness for those of the faithful who desire to consecrate their lives to virginity and celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. The faith of the Church of the East and the Blessed Mother is inspired by the conviction that she was the unique vehicle through whom the Father chose to incarnate the incarnation to take place. A broad synthesis of this Church's liturgical and theological sources would immediately make available to us the intimate kinship between the Son of God and His Mother, which in part will lead us to discern two further miraculous consequences. The first, that, God, that God's grace must have preserved Mary in a unique way from any possibility or actuality of sin throughout her earthly life. The second, at the end of her earthly life, at her death, the sinless Mary, in the totality of her being, through the redemptive act of her son, realized the fruits of renewal instantaneously, just as believers will realize them in the second coming of Christ. This broad overview presents us with a concise foundational understanding of Mariology as viewed by the Church of the East. There are still further consideration to be entertained, specifically regarding points for dialogue, which from the surface appear as divergent teachings. Our presentation will treat three specific areas. The first area will focus upon the issues of Theotokos and Christotokos by presenting the differences and the resolution achieved by signing the Common Christological Declaration in 94. 1994. This, this resolution can serve as a model for the other points in the agenda for dialogue. The second area will focus upon the dogmatic declaration of the Immaculate Conception. Finally, the third area will treat 
the dogmatic declaration of assumption. The dialogue on Mary. One, Theotokos Christotokos divergent views as model for discussion. Theologically, both the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the East have insisted upon acknowledging the two natures, divine and human, in one person of Christ from the beginning of the Theotokos Christotokos controversy. In this, they have always been in agreement. Where the differences came about was in the accounting for a terminology that most fully expresses the union of these two natures in the one person of Christ in relationship to Mary. The Western Church adopted a term, the term Theotokos as articulated by the Council of Ephesus and later as confirmed at the Council of Chalcedon. Meanwhile, the Church of the East continued to use the title Christotokos a term of an older period that in the West was deemed inadequate for the purpose of accounting for a true metaphysical union of the two natures. The political isolation of the Church of the East under Persia and later under Arab, Mongol, and Turkish rule made the resolution of this conflict almost impossible. The separation was not only ecclesial, but geographical, political, cultural, and also linguistic. And seemingly, and similarly, this division was greatly exacerbated from the 13th century on by the almost complete destruction of the Church of the East and the loss of its educational and monastic institutions. Nonetheless, the intention behind the Sumerian dispute, though noble in that it was aimed at venerating and praying to the Blessed Virgin aright, has led our two churches over the past 1,500 years to much frustration, mutual suspicion, and discord. As a result of this adverse condition, the image of the church both in East and West has been hampered in the eyes of the non-Christians, especially the Islamic world, which uses this split as a polemical argument against Christianity. Throughout all these centuries, the reaction and feeling of those outside the church, those to whom we must make our appeal to repent and to be baptized, has, as a result, been one of scorn for us because of our lack of love for one another. They did not in the past and do not now see Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, or Church of the East as Syrians. They see only professed Christians. What we aspire for them to discern in us is an image of Christ but this image appears to them murky because of our, pa of our past self-assertion. This unfortunate situation continued up to very recent time. It wasn't until after the Vatican Second Council when ecumenical relations began to improve between the two churches. On November 9, 1984, the present Catholicos Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, Mardincha, the fourth, made his first official visit to the Vatican and expressed to Pope John Paul II his desire that the ancient misunderstanding, that this ancient misunderstanding be resolved between the two ecclesial bodies. It was becoming clear that both churches had long felt that the scandal of alienation had to be removed so that the Church of Christ could present a common witness to the modern world. When Pope John Paul II and Patriarch Mardincha IV met for a second time and signed the declaration on Christological Declaration on the 11th November 1994, there was mutual agreement on and reciprocal recognition of the ancient Marian terms bearing Christological implications, Theotokos and Christotokos. 
This is what the two heads of the churches declared. The same God, the Word, begotten of his Father before all worlds without beginning, according to his divinity, was born of a mother without a father in the last time, times according to his humanity. The humanity to which the Blessed Virgin gave birth always was that of the Son of God himself. That is why the Assyrian Church of the East is praying the Virgin Mary as the Mother of Christ, our God and Savior. In the light of the same faith, the Catholic tradition addresses the Virgin Mary as the Mother of God and also the Mother of Christ. We both recognize the legitimacy and rightness of these expressions of the same faith and we both respect the preference of each church in her liturgical life and piety. The central piece of this Christological accord was a mutual agreement on Marian titles. Both titles for long centuries have in their respective tradition been, been held with utmost veneration in the minds and hearts of faithful. But through coming together in dialogue and through clarifying Marian theology, the Assyrian Church of the East and the Catholic Church affirmed their unity and the faith despite past suspicions on both sides. In light of this harmony, both the Pope and the Patriarch declared that the controversies of the past led to anathemas and the division brought about in this way were due in large part to misunderstanding. It was clear that by this declaration both churches were actually bringing to an end, to an end one of Christianity's oldest Christological conflict, conflicts and thus effectively initiating a process whose ultimate aim is to heal a wound that has persisted for over than 15 centuries in the church, namely the body of Christ. The humility that our churches have expressed in dialogue is borne out the recognition of our part in the long-standing disunity of Christ's body, and it reflects acknowledgement on our part that we have inflicted as well as received the wounds that that body bears. It eventually, it evidently shows that in emphasizing in a dramatic way the place that veneration for the Blessed Virgin and recognition of her unique place in the salvation history can have great effect in drawing together these or those who love her son for this accord has become the starting point for the transformation of relation between the Catholic and Assyrian, Chaldean, Assyrian and Chaldean churches. Two, on the question of Immaculate Conception, uh, Immaculate Conception of Mary. Our Lord promised the church not new revelation, but an ever deeper penetration into the deposit of faith. This is the teaching of the Catholic Church, a teaching congenial to the thought of the Church of the East. The teaching on the Immaculate Conception, conception uh, which was defined by Pope Pius IX as dogma in 1854, has been offered uh, as a striking example of this truth. Was the concept of Immaculate Conception so clearly present in the scriptures so that without any assistance one could easily discern it? Not really. Accordingly, it is suggested that with the church's assistance one might come to understand that this reality is implied in the words of God to the serpent in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It is suggested that the Immaculate Conception may be similarly implied in the greeting of the Archangel to the Virgin Mary. Hail, full of grace. 
If Mary is the true subject of the prophetic pronouncement of Genesis, and she was never under the domain of Satan, being in a perpetual state of enmity with Satan, the inference is drawn that she was immaculately conceived. Similarly, her being full of grace may imply from this point of view the grace of the Immaculate Conception. Regardless, we would still need assistance to be sure of these implications and inferences. Let us now examine some prayers from the liturgical hours of the Church of the East used both by the Chaldeans and the Assyrians for the Feast of Our Lady. Hopefully they'll shed some light on the question of the Immaculate Conception. All the ground was dry, and Gideon wrung out the dregs from the fleas. This was Mary, and much greater than this. For as the fleas was dry, just so Mary was pure. Lust did not entangle her, nor was she steeped in sin. Therefore, the text cited above illustrate that Mary's freedom from sin has been exalted in the, liturgical, in the liturgies of the Church of the East and has been a part of the theological reflection of the Church's Father from the earliest times. They often spoke in glowing and sweeping terms about Mary's holiness, sinlessness, and grace. However, it must honestly be said that the teaching of Immaculate Conception is problemat problematic for the Church of the East. Not for any reason that could dispute the truth that Mary was preserved from sin, but exactly from the manner in which she was. This divergence in theology demands a corollary conversation concerning the meaning of original sin and of its impact upon the teaching of Immaculate Conception. For the Church of the East, the idea that Mary was free from sin and that, therefore, her conception must have been preserved from the taint of Adam's sin through the Immaculate Conception is insignificant. The Church of the East Fathers did not believe that sin is inherent in or a property of the nature of man. On the contrary, they stressed the goodness of man's nature. For them, Mary's holiness, sinlessness, and grace did not require an immaculate conception but only a recognition of God's special preservative act. This agreement finds its original formulation in Theodore of Mopsuestia and can be seen as so divergent from Augustine's own concepts, which are the basis of the two churches' sub subsequent theological explanation of grace. The 6th century Church of the East Fathers treated the subject of original sin in a different way, which is more dynamic and personal. This theology arose from a debate between bishops of the Church of the East and a person called, a teacher, called Chnana, who was a professor from the school of Edessa, who taught that we did not have free will to choose whether or not to sin due to the fact that original sin was an inher inherited character of our, of our human nature after the fall. The effects of these teachings were realized by parallel parochial and diocesan structures, thus threatening the unity of the Church of the East and the Persian Empire. The bishops countered by asserting that all men have a tendency to sin because of their perception of their own mortality and limitations, not because sin was passed down to them 
through what may be called a genetic code. Sin is not inherited in man's nature, but is a consequence of choices, namely of the exercise of will. It is, it, sin is a property of will, not of nature. Therefore, for them there was no imperative that the virgin, virgin's birth be preserved from Adam's sin, though it is still possible that God would preserve the virgin from willful sin during her entire lifetime. As we have seen from the Church of the East liturgical text, they venerate Mary as a sign of sanctity and grace, peace and reconciliation. That God purposely preserved her and kept her from every sin to make her more pure than all humanity is an idea, again, which is not uncongenial to us. That she, therefore, was made ready for the King of Kings and the God of all to dwell in her would not be a matter of dispute. It is apparent that the Church of the East, in accord with the apostolic tradition, has not stopped at ascribing to Mary a special holiness, one which may be attributed to the saints and to the righteous ones. Moreover, it goes beyond that ascribing to ex ex extol her complete holiness, because if it was necessary for John the Baptist, the, the precursor of our Lord, to be pure and filled with the Holy Spirit, how much more would it seem necessary for Christ's mother to possess holiness and grace? Although sinless, however, holy and pure from the womb of her mother, the Blessed Mother was subject to the consequences of the first fall. Namely, she was a recipient of physical pain and bodily death, and her humanity was therefore in need of the redemption of her son's death procured for all created things. Yet, God preserved Mary from sin, filling her with his grace, while for the rest of us, who are stained with sin, we are in need of renewal and of liberation through baptism. Thus, there is considerable evidence of the convergence of truth taught by the Church of the East and the papal pronouncements of the Immaculate Conception. True, there are distinct differences in philosophical and terminological constructs used to convey this theological and dogmatic truth. These differences can be ascribed to our human limitations and perhaps they are not totally irreconcilable, especially since both traditions hold that the, sinless, that the sinlessness and the holiness of Mary are due to a unique preservative divine act. Three, on the question of assumption of Mary into heaven. Let us now consider Pope Pius XII dogmatic ex cathedra proclamation of Mary's assumption in the year 1950. Within this definition of Mary's assumption into heavenly, within this definition of Mary's assumption <coughs> into heaven, heavenly glory, there are contained three other Marian teachings, namely the Immaculate Conception divine motherhood, and the ever-virginity of Mary. I shall now treat only some of the prayers of ours that the fathers of the Church of the East for the Feast of the Departure, which offer liturgical proclamation, and then we will examine the relationship with the teachings of heavenly assumption as defined by Pius XII. The text is like this. Christ for the honor of the repose of the Virgin Mary sent watchers from on high and they came to meet her in great dignity which was 
appropriate for the holy body of his mother. The second prayer is used in the Chaldean Khudra. It states, Chaldean prayer book. It states, on the day of the departure of her soul from her pure body, the angels of heaven came for her honor with appropriate sanity. She was born upon the clouds and carried by spiritual beings. And among the orders of heavenly beings, she is ever exalted. Again, there's another prayer that adds, Angels from on high <coughs> descended to honor her as they were commanded. The, throne, the thrones recited her glory. Seraphim deemed her body blessed. Cherubim sang praise with their hymns when they saw that she entered among their ranks. Through her prayer there came help from all the sick at the hour of her repose. She entered and flew on the clouds and with her were companies of attendants. If liturgy has an important role in the development of church teachings, then Church of the East Fathers are very clear in exercising that role. Due to Mary's obedience, unique status, and role within her life ministry, I'm sorry, within the life ministry, passion, and glorification of her son, she is portrayed in this, con in this text as having a unique ending of her earthly life, namely at the time of her death. Their, their description of her repose is one of glorification by the angels and exaltation, namely being taken up into heaven. However clear terminology mentioning Mary's body and soul, as in pious dogmatic, dogmatic definition, are not easily traceable in the liturgical tradition of the Church of the East. But what the 13th century father of the Church of the East, Shlimun of al-Basra, writes on this subject can be considered to complement this, church, this church's liturgical tradition and show convergence with the Catholic tradition. For Schliemann's statement makes clear how the church moves from liturgy to theology in forward action towards a deeper understanding of divine truth, already present and experienced in the various parts of the one apostolic and Catholic Church of Christ. And the section cited below from his work the book of the bee, Schliemann seems to be speaking of teachings that were already known and accepted by the church of his times. The text. The giving of Mary by our Lord to John, the son of Zebedee, he said to her, Woman, behold your son. And he said to John, Behold your mother. From that hour he took her away with him and took care of her. And following the ascension of our Lord, Mary lived twelve years. The total years that she lived in the world was fifty-eight years, though others have said sixty-one years. But Mary was not buried in the earth, but angels transported her to paradise and angels bore her bore away her beer. All the apostles were gathered together on the day of her death, and they bowed to her and were blessed by her. But Thomas was in India, so as angels carried him Thomas is the patron saint of the Church of the East. So, as angel carried him and brought him 
and he discovered the angels bearing her beer in the air. Then they brought her beer to Thomas, and he bowed down and was also blessed by her. We observe that according to Schliemann, the object of Mary's being taken up into heaven was that she might be glorified in her total personhood and exalted as an even more intimate to an even more intimate relationship to the presence of God's mystery. The tradition that Mary was buried in the earth find that Mary was not buried in the earth finds a strong affirmation here. Thus, for Schliemann, through her death the Virgin has already reached a state of perfection where she eternally and immaculately exists beyond the limits of time and space. Furthermore, the emphasis of the apostolic witness in Schliemann's account is crucial in that it shows that the author believed that the death and assumption of Mary was a belief that bore the seal of apostolic origin and of authority. It seems to me that both traditions, Catholic and Assyrian, affirm that an explicit, explicit mention of the Assumption provides clear emphasis on the idea that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ had made resurrection available for the rest of us, not as a possibility, but as an actuality that subsists. And all the more here, since Mary herself was preserved from sin, the fruit of the redemption achieved by her son on the cross were applied to her immediately without having to wait for the judgment and the second coming of her son, Jesus Christ. In the mind of the Church of the East Fathers, the mystery of the Blessed Mother should be situated in relation both to Christ and to us, the Church. For them, as for the Latin Fathers, Mary is the archetype of the risen Church. In my opinion, the Assyrian Church of the East has in its liturgical and theological tradition enough evidence to warrant the conclusion that its teaching on Mary is in harmony with the theological essence and interpretation of the Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception and Assumption. Although we may not have the same definitive formulation of these dogmas, however, our teaching and faith are clearly identical. I find no conflict and the way both traditions hold the mother of our Lord in relation to the proclamation of the gospel and the charismatic preaching of the resurrected Christ. Once again, pointing to the need to allow dogmatic truths to be formulated in different words while maintaining faith in the same divinely revealed truth. Therefore, in the Catholic Assyrian dialogue, the teaching on Mary has been an eight, but even more, I'm convinced that when we gather around her in veneration and prayer, we shall be blessed with her memory. And she will pray for us and for our churches as they seek communion in the name of Mary's Son. In light of insights such as these when we realize that Marian teachings, teaching has been a serious source of division, it should be clear to every believer that it is our own sinfulness and lack of charity toward one another that has transformed the holy memory of the Virgin into occasions for dispute and confrontation. Thus, we cause the body of her son, the church, to be inflamed with divisiveness and lack of Christian charity and witness in the world. I have three more conclusions. I'm going to skip, skip, Your Grace, for the lack of time. I still do have time. 
Okay, let me conclude with three uh, observations. I will skip the introduction to those. The, continu the continuous ecclesiological and cultural relevance, well, I think I should read the uh, introduction so that it becomes more intelligible. <laughs> it seems that the real essence of Mariology is not what and how each tradition believes concerning the Blessed Mother, but it is a question of dogmatic discussion between our two churches. Such an exchange would implicitly involve a secondary discussion of theological hermeneutics, in which case these dogmas are contextualized and received by the local churches seeking the restoration of full communion. I thus shall conclude with three insights into the significance of recognizing, reconsidering, certain proposals that have arisen from discussion on Marian dogmas. One, the continuous ecclesiological and cultural relevance of dogmatic expression is increasingly seen as crucial if, in fact, the Assyrian church would be asked to accept the linguistic formulation of the two Marian dogmas as a necessary condition for restoring communion with the Catholic church. A determinative element in the reception process of these recent dogmas by Assyrian Church would be in relatedness to the inner faith of the Assyrian believer. Here, a, cat a characterization is necessary to attract our attention the distinction between doctrine and devotion. A critical method of approaching matters of faith should make clear to us that devotion varies from church to church, age to age, and from culture to culture. But doctrine should be stable and necessarily the same. Unless we can, res we can have a dogmatic formulation without the discrimination of space and time from age to age and from culture to culture, culture then the linguistic dogmatic formulation could become a series a serious obstacle in ecumenical relations realizing that we are always bound in time and space we must allow for the diverse formulation with a plurality of expression of the core of our christian faith in a way that can be effective in the life of individual believers and their communities for the United Church of the future. Two, in the course of things, the formulation and declaration of Marian dogmas have elevated Mary in the eyes of many lay people to such an extent that she is no longer considered by some a mere human being. Instead, she now approaches much more closely to the divine than the rest of us. This, criti this criticism can equally be applied to elements in the, in the theologies of both the Church of the East and the Catholic Church. A more moderate approach to Mariology, to Mariology should therefore depict Mary's position as genuinely both close to God, her Son, and to the Church, namely to us, her sons and daughters in Christ. A balanced approach to Mary should maintain both dimensions of her relationship, namely the Christological and the ecclesiological. And therefore, this should be sought for in the formulation of a Mariology for a united church of the future. Three, are the two Marian dogmas as significant as the dogmas of the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation? The answer is obviously no. There is already a unity existing between our two theological traditions. This unity will 
be more precisely appreciated when truths of Christianity are weighted rather than merely enumerated. If both our traditions have for centuries held foundational belief in the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation, then they can only be sure that other revealed truths may not be of the same importance, particularly for salvation. Therefore, for the sake of ecumenism, a distinction must be made between truths pertaining to the end of salvation and others related to the means. This is said in spite of the fact that all truth of our faith revealed by God must be believed the same way. But there seems to be an ecumenical consensus that for the sake of Christian unity, we need to recognize the concept of a hierarchy of truth, a teaching articulated at Vatican Second Council in 1964. Our two churches stand today at the door of opportunity with the challenge of Christian love set before us. It is ours to take hold of the opportunity that the Catholic Assyrian dialogue affords us and to speak to one another as brothers and sisters seeking mutual understanding. Christ himself will surely be with us in this task until it is finished. For it is he who instituted his church, poured out his unifying spirit on his disciples and their followers, and prayed for their constant oneness. Our Lord has already blessed his church with the unity which already exists in her confession of the Nicene Creed, in her common hope of the resurrection, in the veneration of the Blessed Virgin, and in the charity of she strives to demonstrate in his name, as well as in the sacraments of faith she administers in baptism and Eucharist and, the, in, in, and in the apostolic succession which she preserves intact. There already exists an imperfect unity among our churches. Therefore, let us strive through dialogue, the grace of God, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to an ever more perfect unity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mabawai, for that presentation which was detailed, illuminating, and very positive, encouraging. I was struck, among other things, by the way in which you drew upon liturgical material. So your address was an excellent example of what it means to practice liturgical theology, and all theology should be liturgical. As from the point of view of your own church, as being myself a Western Orthodox, a Roman Orthodox, um, I find myself in very full agreement with what you said, both about the Immaculate Conception and about the Assumption. On the Immaculate Conception, I remember having a public debate some years ago with the Roman Catholic theologian, Jesuit Father Edward Yarnold of Oxford. This was organized by the Ecumenical Society of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And at the beginning, I took rather the line that you took, that the Eastern Church has never accepted the view of original sin put forward by Augustine. If we did hold an Augustinian view of original sin, then we might well have found the need to affirm the Immaculate Conception. But our terms of reference are different. 
Therefore, I said uh, I saw the question as primarily one not about the status of the Holy Virgin, but about the understanding of original sin. Father Edward did not agree with me, so we did have quite a lengthy debate. But at the end, he said to me, would you, as an Orthodox, agree that from the first moment of her conception, the Virgin Mary was given special grace by God in view of her future role as mother of the Savior. And I found no difficulty in saying in answer to that question, yes. And I think you would also say yes. Now, we do have a little time for uh, discussion uh, time is the servant, not the master. We don't have to keep strictly to our program, so Jack Figgle tells me. I suggest we have a break of only two minutes. Please don't get up and leave your seats, because then it will take 15 minutes before we get you all back in here again. But I'll ask Jack to distribute, to anyone who wants to ask a question, a little yellow slip. So, two minutes... If you'd like to talk to your neighbor, especially if you don't already know them, introduce yourself. Now, let me feed in a few of the questions that we have received. First of all, a factual question. Uh, Mar Bawai, you have mentioned the dialogue of the Church of the East with the Catholic Church, with the Pope and the Vatican. Has there been a similar dialogue between the Church of the East and the Eastern Orthodox Churches, the Byzantine and Slav Churches? Uh, unfortunately, uh, until today, uh, such a dialogue has not taken place. There are very serious contacts. Uh, I'm pleased to say some of these contacts are mediated by uh, the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity, the annual visits between Rome and Constantinople, uh, in order to facilitate for a dialogue between uh, Eastern Orthodox and the Church of the East. However, a footnote to this, uh, it's important to see the dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox and the larger context of the dialogue between Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox Churches. In that area, we have been in dialogue uh, for the last uh, six, seven years, and there has uh, arisen a great uh, amount of difficulties. Uh, and I'm sorry to say the difficulties... Uh, mainly come uh, from um, uh, certain uh, Oriental Orthodox churches uh, demanding us to abandon part of our tradition that is uh, related to our relationship to the Council of Ephesus. So once, hopefully we hope to resolve this so that our approach is uh, more uh, expedite with the, with the or, uh, Eastern Orthodox churches. Thank you. Here's another question. What is the view of the Church of the East regarding the titles often applied in the Catholic Church to Mary, the title Mediatrix of All Graces, and the title Co-Redeemer? And would a proclamation uh, by the Catholic Church of these things as dogmas, would this help the cause of unity? You find the answer in the question itself. Uh, just as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, titles may be more uh, into the area of piety than into the area of doctrine. So therefore, uh, the distinction, if, we, if, if the intention is always to preserve the redemptive 
withdrawal of salvation to our Lord, then I personally see no hindrance or obstacles in attributing any pietistic title to the Blessed Virgin. Uh, if and when uh, these uh, titles are dogmatized, proclaimed, I think uh, a serious hindrance will arise uh, in dialogue, not uh, with the Church of the East. Uh, the, we, we would be the smallest, uh, the, probably the less uh, significant churches in the ecumenical dialogue that's taking place, but I'm afraid it will cause uh, a major difficulty with uh, many of the Eastern uh, Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox churches. I have here a comment from the floor, not a question. Such titles as Mediatrix of All Graces and Co-Redemptrix are not now and never have been canonical or liturgical terms in the Catholic Church. Um, but we do say, certainly in the Greek and R Slav traditions, Most Holy Mother of God, save us. However, here is a slightly different question. <laughs> here is a slightly different question. Several people have asked it, arising out of your talk, about uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary and free will. How does the Church of the East reconcile an understanding of God's special preservation of Mary from personal sin with the necessity of maintaining her ordinary human free will. If indeed freedom and grace are not mutually exclusive and freedom presupposes the capacity to choose, then how can a Mary who is preserved from the will to sin be a Mary who is free? But there's a little footnote here which says, is not the highest freedom the freedom to choose only the good, not the inability to choose the bad? So I think people would like to hear your answer here. It's, it was a major risk that I took in my paper when I elaborated on the question of uh, original sin. This is definitely not my area, and I am afraid I cannot answer your question in a way to satisfy it theologically and do justice both to your curiosity and to my own tradition, starting with Theodore and going on in, in all the Eastern synods of the Church of the East as the fathers elaborated on this question. What, if I may... Uh, reiterate uh, what is written there in a more way relative, relevant to the question as you see the understanding of original sin is uh, in our uh, tradition nature even after the fall continues to be good but man realizing his own mortality gets panicked and sins And that sin does not come out of his fallen nature. It comes out of his own free will. In the case of Mary, true, we can trace a divine preservative act. That act could be attributed in collaboration with her free will. Now, to me, that is the line that I would draw and would not pass because I would recognize a mystery at work. I have learned my lesson from the controversies that my church has engaged in in trying even to very relevant issues concerning Theotokos and Christotokos and the question of unity, ontological unity, and the hypostasis and pneuma and nature. And look what we have gotten ourselves into, what our forefathers have resulted us to suffer for centuries and centuries. And after all that time, we come and boldly say it was a misunderstanding. 
So, in order to avoid other misunderstandings, I... I <laughs> I recognize, I recognize the importance of uh, this topic. Again, this is not my area, but where I would uh, draw the line is uh, in the... Uh, uh, I would like to keep my position uh, uh, in, in accordance to my tradition and rearticulating the fact that human nature continues to be good, uh, but the corruption comes uh, in, in the choices that we make. This is not so much a question, though you may wish to develop it, but a comment. The phrase that I liked most in your talk was, move from liturgy to theology. What would be your reaction? Let us keep the theology that is in our respective liturgies don't go for dogmas well I think you would agree with that yes I would, uh, I would, yes. I would definitely agree. Good. let me come then to another more specific question um, does the Church of the East uh, have examples of apparitions of the Blessed Virgin in particular places weeping icons or miracles especially associated with the Holy Virgin in the way that certainly the Catholic Church does, also the Coptic and other non-Chalcedonian churches and also the Greek and Slav churches and Romanian. Most definitely. The Blessed Virgin uh, role in the life of the Church of the East faithful is extremely significant. It has been throughout the centuries. Uh, stories uh, and accounts of uh, apparition that I am familiar with, uh, the latest uh, myself, have seen uh, photographs of, uh, in fact, I visited uh, a small chapel uh, of uh, Our Lady in northern part of Iran two years ago, Easter in 1997, uh, where uh, the chapel, the wall were, were uh, painted in a very, uh, with chemicals so that uh, it was the local government uh, trying to avoid uh, tens of thousands of people visiting the place, most of, w of whom were Muslims. As you know, in Islam, there is a particular devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Uh, I've seen photograph of uh, her image uh, in blue, uh, veil and face, uh, a bit uh, murky, a bit unclear, but definitely a characteristic of our uh, uh, lady appearing on the wall of that, uh, that even after a second and third time of painting the uh, image kept uh, uh, coming up, uh, bypassing the chemical. It, it had to be burned with some type of chemical in order to eliminate it fully. And the lives of the faithful, as I mentioned, uh, the bless. I'm not certain that uh, credible evidence like accounts like these have been concerning icons. As you know, images and icons are not part of our practice since the 6th century, being a church within the Islamic uh, culture, we could not maintain images, although despite the fact that in liturgical consecration of churches, uh, an icon of the Lord is, is part of the requirement. But we don't have in practice any icon or images uh, today. So I'm not sure of uh, credible accounts. However, in, in Assyrian families uh, across the, uh, the, 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 the board, uh, you can see uh, many families have, uh, have icons, but as far as miracles or operation or weeping, I, I, don't, I do not know. And here is one last question, because we need to break for our midday meal. I must apologize to those whose questions I haven't been able to include. 
What are the January and May feasts of Mary which you mentioned? Uh, do you observe September the 8th as her birthday? November the 22nd as her presentation in the temple? Do you celebrate the Assumption on the 15th of August? And indeed, I might expand this by saying, do you celebrate her conception, not necessarily immaculate, on the 8th of December? or thereabouts. <laughs> the January, May, and August uh, feasts of Our Lady are... Uh, January is uh, the feast of her birth. Uh, uh, May is the feast of her being the uh, uh, patron uh, saint of... Uh, Agriculture uh, uh, of uh, of plants and, and and fruit, and the August obviously is uh, is, is uh, the feast of Assumption. These are the three liturgical. However, um, I know a footnote here in the uh, Church of the East liturgy, we have one uh, major feast, but three sections that is used in alternation for each feast. However, the Chaldean uh, book of Khudra that I also cite here uh, have developed uh, an independent feast for each uh, commemoration. And we have examined uh, those. Uh, obviously, an Eastern uh, Catholic uh, and non-Catholic counterpart, there's a uh, sometimes there's kind of suspicion that the text used were originally uh, from the tradition itself. These texts used by the Chaldean Church for the uh, memorials of Our Lady were uh, examined, and, and I'm citing from the Chaldean Khudra, they have been examined and uh, seen as genuine, so I was free to examine them, to cite them with the liberty and confidence that they do represent uh, the tradition of the Church of the East. I have a closing uh, point to make, uh, especially for His Grace's uh, uh, introductory remark concerning the position of the Assyrian Church uh, towards the Council of Ephesus. A recent dialogue in the context of the Middle East Council of Churches and the context of Pro Oriente Foundation in Vienna and in the context of the Catholic-Assyrian dialogue, have uh, gathered enough evidence that it is uh, absolutely acceptable, absolutely possible to say that the Church of the East would, without any reluctance, accept all dogmatic teachings, uh, if not dogmatic teachings of Chalcedon, let's say, of uh, Ephesus, but any teachings, theological teachings of Ephesus and dogmatic teaching of Chalcedon without any reluctance today. The only reservation uh, that we would express uh, concerning uh, the Council of Ephesus is non-theological aspect of it, is the ecclesiological condemnation of Nestorius. That is something, uh, it's a standard position of my tradition, of my church. Uh, knowing that, had we known that the heresy, as uh, His Grace expressed it, had we known the heresy ascribed to Nestorius uh, was real, uh, and, and in fact Nestorius had taught that heresy, we would have uh, condemned Nestorius with two hands instead of one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, with the same uh, vehemence uh, and vigor, we would argue in favor of Nestorius being not Nestorian, and particularly uh, on behalf of Theodore uh, being not uh, Nestorian uh, as, uh, as uh, claimed and understood even by most scholars today. Thank you very much. The response from the audience indicates very clearly how warmly we have appreciated your presentation and your 
generosity in you know, the answers to our questions. I recall how at the end of the last century the Archbishop of Canterbury maintained a mission to the Assyrian churches, a most remarkable mission, perhaps unique in Christian history, because their basic principle was that they should not convert a single member of the Assyrian churches to Anglicanism that they were absolutely excluding any kind of proselytism. Their sole purpose was to support and help the Assyrian church, and they remained faithful to that principle. One of the things they did was to help your church to print liturgical texts, and I've seen one of the Syriac texts that were printed by the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission but the members who were high church Anglicans had difficulty about the places liturgically where the name of Nestorius was mentioned. And they found a very reasonable solution. They simply left a blank in the printed text. <laughs> so the members of the Assyrian church using these texts could fill in the name by hand. <laughs> But now we know much more about Nestorius than they did in the 19th century since the discovery of his defense, surviving only in Syriac, the book of Heraclides, and there's a far better understanding. And indeed, I pray that in the very near future there may be full communion with the Church of the East and the churches of the West. As you have shown, there is no dogmatic obstacle, so may it soon be accomplished. Thank you.